Welcome to Retire Smarter with Kevin Krosky. Find answers to your toughest questions and get educated about the financial world. It's time to retire smarter. It's time for another edition of Retire Smarter. Walter Storholt here with you alongside Kevin Krosky, President and Wealth Advisor at True Wealth Design. Kevin, you ready for another great episode today? Part four of our series about your investing process. Yes, part four of our two-part series. That's right. Four of two. We're, we're getting 200% more than we bargained for. Uh, no, no, no. Is it 100% more than we bar- We're getting 100% more than we bargained for. Yes, yes. I was. Um, my mom always said I was an overachiever, so there we go. There you go. Yeah. I have a feeling this won't be the last time we plan to do a one- or two-part series that, that extends to multi-parts. Yeah, you know, the uh, quick aside, I, I just realized uh, that I've been doing the podcast now for more than a year, I think about tw- or 13 months or so. Um, I don't know what episode we're up to, but we're also up to about uh, 1,000 listeners, 1,000 downloads per month. So frankly, if you would ask me if I would have expected 1,000 downloads a month, people tuning in uh, a year later, my answer would have definitely been no. So uh, it's, it's nice to see that we've gotten some good compliments and good feedback and definitely have had some clients say that they it's been a nice way for them to learn and just just learn more about things on their own terms uh, you know, when they want to. And we've had a lot of people reach out to us as well that aren't clients and said that they found this pretty insightful and asked for our help. So it's it's been good. It's been a good year, Walter. I definitely feel smarter after every show we record. So I think the name you picked for the program certainly is apt. And uh, a little a little aside to that, you are at episode number 30. This is 30 today. So it's a, a mini milestone, if you will. I was saving the All big right. party for episode 50, but we can throw a mini hooray for episode 30 today. Sounds good. I actually meant to celebrate. That's along the way. I actually meant to celebrate twenty five, but then we just we got busy and forgot that we were recording twenty five, so I didn't (laughs) didn't mention it when we got there. But uh, (laughs) that's right. Well, it's going to be a good uh, final part four of this conversation, where we've been learning a lot about your investing process and evaluating different ways that these plans and investments and your philosophy into all these things come together and how it differs from person to person. So, what's our aim here in the final part four of this conversation? Sure. So um, again, let me let me restate rule number one because it's I don't want to lose sight of this. Uh, but your financial plan, your retirement plan, is the objective of your investment plan. So if you don't have that, don't pass go. Don't just start trying to throw a dart at the dartboard. You know that is kind of rule number one. But then in the prior series episodes, we went ahead and we talked about really about the investing process. You know what that looks like what is uh, not only an investment process like, but what should it constitute? And we really talked about, uh, I would say, the asset allocation. So asset allocation is not stock picking. It's really kind of combining whether it's stocks, bonds, real estate, cash, growth stocks, value stocks, big stocks, small stocks, domestic, international, and all kinds of different bonds as well um, into you know your beautiful looking pie chart that is tied back specifically to your own financial plan and the return that you need from your investments to make your plan work, as well as considering the capacity for risk that you can afford to take now that you've turned off the paycheck spigot and are heading into retirement or close to it. But Largely what we spoke about was that asset allocation. And uh, for the reason being is uh, I referenced in the last episode, studies that have shown that asset allocation is going to explain more than 90% of the return that you're going to get from your investments. When you look at stock picking, that is one of those variables, but it is actually a a negative contributor to your net returns uh, from your investment portfolio. And, And I said that, you know, the ingredients that you pick, the underlying funds are important Certainly, you want to have good ingredients, you know, organic, non-GMO, all these kind of, you know, words that you hear when you walk into Whole Foods or Whole Paycheck or whatever it's called. (laughs) And I want to put some good ingredients in your body. You want the same thing going into your investment portfolio. But the recipe, somewhat counterintuitive to a lot of people, does in fact explain more and matters more than the ingredients, but both are certainly important. So while we focus most of our time on the recipe, on the asset allocation, in this final episode, I figured we'd talk a little bit about the ingredients. Okay. I always like talking about the ingredients. I mean, it's it's fun seeing the finished product, but sometimes the ingredients are just as much fun to sample and taste. I like your subtle dig there at uh, Whole Paycheck. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was good. Yes. 
Yeah, so what we're going to talk about when we think about these ingredients, I'm not going to get in and start talking about specific mutual funds and these are the funds that are on our recommended lists or anything like that. You know, we're really going to talk about some principles and uh, probably you're going to walk away from this episode you know, having more questions than answers, but that's good because <laughs> that's going to be indicative that you're learning uh, and having some knowledge that you previously didn't have. And so that's kind of the, the path that we all take as we learn. We start often start learning that we <laughs> we become more humble and we ask more questions than what we have answers to but that's that's the ongoing path of learning so so we're not going to we be talk talking about, we're not going to be talking about chicken noodle versus tomato versus uh, wedding soups we're just talking about soups and cereals not special k versus you know uh, what's the other general mills cereals that kind of thing it's all lobster bisque, baby. That's all you got to know. Lobster <laughs> oh, bisque. all right. Yeah, you just went up a few notches in my book with a, with a lobster bisque mention. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> my grandparents um, live in Maine, so I'm a big everything lobster fan. I'm you know I'm I'm all there for it. So. All right. Um, so when you think about ingredients, uh, so where we left off in the last episode, we talked a little bit about kind of active and passive, and uh, broadly defined. When you have passive investments, they're more index-like. Um, they're not doing a lot of trading. They are not trying to make any sort of timing decisions as to when to get in or out of the market or when to favor this asset class or that asset class or buy or sell this or that stock. Those are more in the active camp. So again, passive is more index and then you have active and you know it's all those other things that I mentioned. And again, there, there's all these gradations in between. So some funds may literally be turning over their entire portfolio two times over the course of a year, uh, where some active managers are maybe, you know, maybe they're only turning over a third of their portfolio. Index funds on average, you know, will only turn over maybe like five or 10%, you know, once a year. The S&P 500 uh, board uh, will come in and say, hey, these eight companies are are now no longer part of the S&P 500, they're smaller, and where these new eight companies are coming in. So there's very little kind of turnover and active trading in that regard. But those are kind of two broad camps just to think about when you get into your investment manager selection or selecting your ingredients. And when historically, before indexing really became more popular, you know, there was this kind of belief out there and it's still there and, and a lot of people frankly still have it uh, but it was like well why do i just want to go ahead and you know do something that's going to be average i mean <laughs> heck we're americans right <laughs> americans aren't average i mean they stick out our chest and like thump it a couple times here um but that's just not us and so why would i want average investments i want you know above average investments heck you know i'm gonna pick great investments and I remember when I was going through grad school and um, learning about uh, the research about active and passive investing, you know, I had this one testosterone levels were a lot higher back in uh, early 20s and probably <laughs> a, a bigger ego and more confidence and, and certainly less humble. I'm like, well, I'm smarter than the average bear. I'll be able to go ahead and pick some of these better investments and make smarter decisions. And I'm certainly above average. But one of the things we talked about last time is uh, that sort of belief about uh, ability works really well in other areas of our lives. In sports, uh, the Cleveland Browns pick up a free agent uh, you know, from the New York Giants, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. He's a great wide receiver in New York. He's a great wide receiver in Cleveland so far after uh, a couple games. And <laughs> his, his off-the-field um, personality problems also persisted. But uh, it also works in work. Uh, you know, you have you are in charge of hiring and you are looking to fill a position and you see, say, it's a sales professional and they have a demonstrated track record of success at the prior positions. You hire them. You believe their performance is going to persist uh, in the new role in your company. And investing, it just doesn't work. It's kind of this paradox of skill is what I would call it. And being that we're in October and in the heart of the baseball playoffs, I thought uh, I would work in uh, a little bit of a baseball story here, Walter. How, Ooh, how's that? All sound? right. I like it. Have you ever done baseball announcing in your sports broadcasting career? It's one sport that I, uh, 
I just could never really get into from a broadcasting standpoint. I probably would have been good at it because you know me. I talk a lot, and so I, I can fill airtime with the best of them. But uh, now I did do some softball announcing so I, that kind of, that kind of counts i was the now it was p it was pa announcing was this on like a weekend and there was a keg of beer on the side of the softball field is that the kind we were talking about no 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 uh unc uh north carolina tar heels women's softball i was the i was the pa guy for a couple of seasons during my schooling years and then for a season or two afterward it was sort of a freelance part-time gig and i was i was the pa guy not necessarily play-by-play but let me tell you I got into it, so they they loved me. When I went and first auditioned, uh, they had like five or six uh, students there ready to audition, and so when I sat down at the mic, they were like, if you don't mind this aside story, but I think you'll find it humorous, and they said, you know, all right, uh, you know, yeah, now your turn, so I sat down and got ready. It was just a scrimmage they were doing, so it was kind of, they were rotating in different PA people to try them out for the season, and I looked over, and I was like, I mean, do you want this straight laced or do you want it to like have a little fun with it? Or, you know, how do you, how do you want to do it? And they were like, have fun with it, I guess. And I was like, all right. So I turned on the mic and the player walks up and I said, now batting number six, Alyssa Francona. And the coach looks up at the PA booth, says something to somebody and points up at the booth and they come running up there. And I'm like looking around at everybody. I'm like, uh Oh, I'm in trouble. They didn't, they did not like that. And the girl pops her head and she says, Coach wants to know if you can do the entire season. I was like, you're, you're, you're hired. And I was like, all right, great. So, you know, it ended up being a lot of fun. So I, I leaned into it. I think the fans had a good time with it for a couple of seasons there. But that's my that's the extent of my baseball or slash softball announcing. All right, all right. That's uh, I appreciate the uh, the insight into your past. That's a good story there. We're, we're gonna have to redo uh, your intro, and we'll do it in like uh, a sports theme. I'll do your. <laughs> Standing yes, at five well, we'll, feet eleven inches tall from, I'm six foot, Walter. Six foot. Okay. Well, I was close. I it was, it was kind of like the uh, guest last week on the Black Monday. I was only a few points off. <laughs> All right. Well, speaking of guests, I have another one for you. Okay. And I think this is more in the softball category. So, but it's baseball. So I don't know. It's an easy pitch to hit. <laughs> uh, but who was the last professional baseball player to bat four hundred? Oh gosh, I do not know my baseball history. Last baseball player to bat four hundred. Oh, I don't know my. Can you give me a hint how how long ago it was? No, no. Oh, <laughs> uh, Mike Mike Trout. Was, he's the he's the big name now, right? Well, okay. So it was you were you were, you were off by several decades, but it was uh, it was Ted Williams. <laughs> that was going to be my second uh, guess, actually. Yes, I'm sure. If, it was. if you had given me no, no, if you had given me the time frame, Ted Williams would have been my other guess. So he did it back in 1941. <laughs> oh, just, just a little while ago. It's nearly 80 years now, and so nobody's done it since. How come? Is it is it because that hey, he was the best and nobody else can do it? Uh, I don't think he was the best ever, right? I mean, certainly very good, but somebody's got the capacity to do it again, I would think. All right. Well, here's what I would say is the paradox of skill, and then we're, we'll incorporate it where luck comes in as well. Okay. Uh, so when you think about uh, where athletes are today, I mean, you have people that are in the Major League Baseball League that are from around the world. I mean, you got people that are coming in from Cuba, the Dominican Republic, Japan, uh, people that are kind of born and bred for this stuff by the time that they're you know, really walking around. Um, so we have this global influx in terms of the talent that's going into the leagues. The players are bigger, faster, stronger. They have better diets, improved training techniques. The overall skill level has just been raised for everybody. And so does it mean that people aren't as good as Ted Williams? I would say just the opposite. I'd say that, you know, people today better. It's a different era for sure. But for all those reasons I just cited, the average skill in the league has gone up. And the interesting thing is we can actually use statistics to prove this. So when you go back, say, it's almost 120 years now, but um, around 1900 is when the modern era of baseball was uh, said to start. So you got 1900. And when you go back to those first couple decades in the modern era, the average hitter batted about right between 250 and 260. So they were getting on base about one out of four times. And during those first couple decades, there were 400 hitters about a handful of times. So people were, you know, getting up there and Ted Williams was kind of the last one in 1941. And when you look since say 1950, 
all the way up through, you know, just the recent past few years, the batting average has still been pretty stable. The average has been about one out of four times, you know, 250, 260, but no one has hit 400. So statistically speaking, the average is the same, but when you look at the variation, the variation has got a lot closer to the average. And mathematically, we call that standard deviation. Back in 1921, the standard deviation of batting averages was about 40 points. And by the time you got into Ted Williams in 1941, standard deviation had fallen to about 32, 33. All the way now in, say, 2003, it was just 26 points. So now that we know the standard deviation and the average, we can calculate, well, what's the probability that somebody's going to bat 400? And what we would find when we go through that math is that in any given year, the chance is below 0.1% or less than 1 in 1,000 somebody's going to do it. And that's the paradox of skill. Whenever the average talent is improving, the outcome of the activity combines skill and luck. And as skill improves, luck becomes more important in shaping results. So in baseball, you have more people that are better but you don't have anybody that looks really as exceptional as Ted Williams did, at least compared to the average, you know, back in 1941. And, it, and, and it's not same, even close, Kevin. I mean, I'm just uh, not to interrupt your flow, but I'm looking at you got me looking at baseball stats now. And the closest person to get there in the last mm, 20 years, we'll say from 2000 onward, there were uh, two guys who hit 372. In the year 2000, Todd Helton yeah. and uh, uh, Garcia Parra, Nomar Garcia Parra. And I mean, that's, I mean, 372 to 406 or whatever it was that uh, Ted Williams is was doesn't seem like a lot, but in baseball terms, that's still a pretty wide gap. Yes, it totally is. And the analogy here is the same thing has happened in investment markets. The average person, the average investment manager is better today than they were, you know, 20, 40 years ago. And when you look at, you know, whenever you're in the stock market or bond market, for every buyer, there has to be a seller. And both of those people can't be right. <laughs> you know, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And so mathematically, when you add this up, it's called this kind of limiting constraint. And on average, when you have all the active managers in aggregate, you know, there's no net winners. In fact, they lose by their cost because the costs are higher for active management than passes management. So there may be some active managers that are winning, um, but those active managers are profiting at the expense of the other active managers that are losing. And in aggregate, nobody's winning. Um, so, and when you look at it, you can see the same sort of thing, like the dispersion and the returns, the variability in the returns is less today for many asset classes than it was before. The number of active managers that are outperforming their passive benchmarks are even less today than they were, say, like 40 years ago or so when indexing really started going. It's kind of always been that way because costs, uh, active management costs, you know, having people, having research, uh, boots on the ground, talking to you know company CEOs and CFOs and things like that, or having some sort of unique data source that other active managers don't have, all that costs money. And um, I always like to joke and say whenever I go to the investment conferences, and I look around and see the people and how they're dressed, uh, I can usually tell the active managers from the passive managers because the active managers have the more expensive suits on and the better shoes. It's just the way that it works. But that's what the paradox of skill says. You know, as the skill gets better, if you do have somebody that is an outperformer, generally it's more attributable to luck than to their skill. And it's just like, uh, I used to do this when I would do some educational classes. I would pass around a coin Everybody in the room would have a coin and I would say, OK, let's just flip this coin. And if you get a head uh, on the flip, you stand up. If you get a tail, then you sit down. And inevitably, if the room is large enough, I would have somebody standing up after like four or five flips. And does that mean that they were a really good head flipper or does that mean they just got a little lucky? And same goes for investment managers. Inevitably, the, the statistics will say that somebody's going to outperform. But when you look at the research and identify these people that have outperformed, when you look in a successive period, say somebody outperformed, you know, they were a top decile, top 10% manager over the prior five years. Okay, that person's smart. We talked about, you know, somebody that did this in the last episode, Martin Zweig. And I'm going to give that person 
money, they have this ability, they have the foresight, they have a crystal ball. I'm going to give that person money because they did really well. And then you invest with them and inevitably over the next five year period, you lag the benchmark, you underperform the person that you thought could go ahead and you know, save you from the following knife or the bear market or what have you, just didn't have that ability to replicate what they did in that prior period. And that's kind of the, that's the paradox of skill. And, and that's exactly what we see that happens. When we go back and think about selecting ingredients, again, you kind of have these two camps, active or passive. And because of the paradox of skill and because of all the evidence that shows that active managers in general do not keep up with their passive benchmarks, they're more expensive and some of the things that they do just tends to subtract value. And again, it's, you always have to look at this net of cost, but you should always start with a passive benchmark for whatever asset class as the benchmark, as the starting point. You know, if you're going to veer from that, you should have a good reason why. So we're talking about kind of this more indexing based type approach. And one of the things I will mention is while that's a good starting point and that's how I start as well, whenever we're looking at, you know, investing in an asset class, it does have some shortcomings. And I'll just talk about a couple here. And again, this is going to probably going to raise more questions for people than provide answers. But again, that's, that's the whole process of learning. Uh, so whenever you look at some asset classes, certain asset classes are good to be passive and go ahead and do an indexing type approach. Um, some are better than others. But when you think about bonds, bonds are an interesting one to go ahead and, and use. So that's why I picked it. But almost everybody, if they look at it, say a 401k statement that they had is going to have uh, some sort of bond that's like a U.S. aggregate bond. And oftentimes in 401k plans, they're going to be an index fund for some different liability reasons more often than not. But when you think about what happens within the index, within a bond index, uh, this, you know, it's uh, Barclays U.S. Aggregate Bond Index. And it's really changed over the last 10 years or so. Uh, but if you have, whether it's the U.S. government or, say, a corporation that's issuing debt, the more debt they issue, the more it's going to be represented in this index. Now, let me ask you a question, Walter. If you're a bank and if you're lending money and you have a borrower, you have some company that keeps borrowing more and more and more and more, and are you going to be maybe raising an eyebrow compared to a company that's not borrowing nearly as much? You know, which one really poses more risk? Well, the borrowers that keep piling up how much we get owed are compiling the risk. Unless they're being good about paying it all back, then I'm okay with them getting more and more. Yeah, it sounds good. But as you have more leverage, and I know I kind of answered the question in my tonality and asking it, but that as somebody borrows more money, all else being equal, you know, they're going to have more leverage and they're going to have more risk. And these bond indices, basically, it's literally by total debt outstanding. So as you have a company that is issuing more debt, that company is going to be more represented in that index. Over the last 10 years since the, you know, the great financial crisis, uh, 2008, 2009, the U.S. government issued a ton of debt, really kind of ballooned their balance sheet. Uh, so what's changed over the last 10 years is this U.S. aggregate bond index. Uh, the government bonds are much, much more represented than in the prior 10-year period. And not only that, but the duration of the bonds um, are basically kind of think of like uh, the average maturity uh, has gone a lot longer. So when you look at the index, the index composition, the underlying composition has really changed quite significantly over the last 10 years. And then when you actually saying, let's go pick uh, one of these lowest cost index funds within that category, I just looked one up from Vanguard before I got jumped on the call today. And you look over the last 10 years, and literally, it's about the most inexpensive option in the category. And costs do matter. But I'm always one to favor lower cost investments. But it's been kind of middle of the road for the intermediate bond category. It's been literally in the 50th percentile over the last 10 years. So, you know, half of the funds in that category have done better than it and half of it have done less, even though it's literally like the lowest cost option in the entire category. And that's, I would say, is largely because it's had to go ahead and follow the general market for bonds and it's had to own more of these lower yielding longer duration bonds namely government bonds and so the underlying composition it's followed those changes and it hasn't done nearly as well as the category in general kevin great points so far i find the illustrations always helpful do you have any other examples of uh, asset classes where the this passive nature becomes a problem 
Uh, sure. I can think of a, a couple off my head. Um, I, mean, I don't have the numbers like I did for the bond index, but you know, Vanguard has another uh, very inexpensive option for emerging markets. So these are, you know, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, all these kind of burgeoning economies that uh, maybe aren't as well developed as, uh, say, the U.S. or Canada or Japan or Europe or what have you. And that one too, uh, again, don't quote me here, uh, but it's it's probably right around that 50th percentile as well, even though it's like literally the lowest cost option, uh, an index option within the, the emerging market category. Another one, a couple more actually. So uh, bank loans, bank loans are, uh, are basically first position security. So they're kind of top tier, you know, they're going to get paid first before anybody else does if a company went out of business, if you will. Um, but when you look within, say, bank loans, which are fairly have been fairly attractive over the last several years, they're kind of short duration. They have uh, a fairly high yield. They perform pretty well. But if you look at some passive options within that asset class, again, I'm kind of going from memory here, but um, you're probably going to find that the passive option is going to only have bested maybe 20 or 30 percent of the funds in the category. So the active managers have uh, about 80, 70 or 80 percent of the active managers have bested uh, the index. So that's that's another one. Also, you have uh, something called preferred stock. These are another type of security that banks or other financial institutions typically issue. Uh, if you look within that asset class, the passive options inevitably underperform the average active manager. So it kind of depends, you know, if you're looking at large US stocks, an indexing option is going to be pretty good. If you look at bonds, particularly aggregate bonds, because the underlying uh, composition of the index has changed significantly, so you're kind of exposing yourself to different risks that you may or may not want to be exposed to, or I gave the emerging markets or bank loans. These are all different investment asset classes where indexing uh, may not necessarily work as well. So having a passive approach, having a low-cost passive approach as the starting point, I say is always a good starting point. And me personally, I always want to see evidence that the contrary why I should veer from that starting point. But I've at least rattled off a few that gives you some good examples of where you can probably do a little bit better by having a smart approach than just going for the pure low cost indexing option. So a great four part series going through all of these different little nuances of the investing process. And it's a lot to absorb, Kevin. If somebody's listened to these episodes, what do you want to be sort of the the main takeaway uh, to walk away from uh, kind of all this information about different types of investing and the science that goes in behind it and some of the great examples that you've laid out for us? Yeah. So go back to rule number one, uh, you know, your financial plan. Uh, I know we haven't really talked about financial planning through this series. We've talked about it a lot. We've, uh, you know, the Retire Smarter podcast is about that. Um, but ultimately, a big part of your retirement plan is the investment plan, which needs to be matched back to your retirement plan. I can't emphasize the importance of that enough. You know, if somebody walks into my office and asks for investment help and we don't have a financial plan done, I'm like, well, again, it's kind of blindly throwing darts at the dartboard and hoping you're going to hit it nine times out of 10. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, so that's rule number one. Rule number two, of course, is <laughs> see rule number one. But as you get beyond that and that bad joke that I just made, it's really about a process. You know, it's not some man behind the mask or, you know, kind of a woman behind the curtain that's just kind of haphazardly picking things because they heard a good idea at an investment conference or they read Money Magazine or something like that. Again, what we always default to because we don't have a crystal ball and we don't believe anybody has a crystal ball is science. Uh, and that's what we've talked about. We've talked about the process. We've talked about asset allocation or the recipe, which matters more than the ingredients or the underlying funds that you're picking, which are, are also important. Uh, but that's what we talked about. And so if you don't have a process, if you're not sure if you know you have a good process, if you're not sure if you have a good allocation, a good recipe, if you're not sure if you have good ingredients, uh, if you're just kind of haphazardly picking things or you're not sure if your advisor is haphazardly picking things, we'd be happy to talk with you and, and give you a second opinion and take a look at that. But again, if you come into our office and you're asking for that, <laughs> question number one is, well, what's your financial plan going to look like? And literally, if, if we don't have a good plan, then there's no way that we or anybody else like us can really go ahead and have a really effective investment plan for you unless it's kind of blindly hitting that bullseye. 
Well, if you need help with, again, the full plan, don't come just looking for that one particular element. I know we spent four podcasts on it, but this is just one piece of that greater puzzle, and uh, we got into a good bit of depth into that side. But we can't ignore all of those other pieces as well. And if you want to talk to Kevin about all of those things and go over your own plan and work with an experienced financial advisor on the True Wealth team, you can do that by going to truewealthdesign.com. Click the Are We Right For You button to schedule a 15-minute introductory call. That's truewealthdesign.com. Or you can call directly if you prefer, 855-TWD-PLAN. That's 855-893-7526. This would also be a good time for me to mention that uh, you should definitely check out the events tab on truewealthdesign.com, by the way. Find out about upcoming workshops, get all the details, and sign up right from your smartphone or computer. There's a, a link in the description of today's show, once again, to get to truewealthdesign.com. And if you're interested in attending an upcoming event, just look at the events tab. It'll take you to the right place. Kevin, appreciate uh, some of the baseball knowledge on today's show, in addition to all the financial stuff. I, uh, I, I'll be better at my next trivia night having absorbed some of this information so that's good you might have to like uh it'll be hockey season here pretty soon so it's got to be hockey or or nfl football or i don't know well i'll, I'll work on it Ho- hockey i'll be better at that's my sport so hockey i'll be much better at i'll be i'll be ready for you i used to be into baseball back in the day just just lost interest as i got older for some reason but also, I'm re- i played baseball my, my up through 25 26 and um and I found volleyball, and I'm like, you know, I play third base. And I maybe touch the ball five times a game. I play two man volleyball, and I'm, I'm touching it every single time. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's like watching paint dry to me now. But I played it for many, many years. Yeah, it's got that romantic. What do they call it? Ba- baseball's a romantic game. Was that the famous line from Moneyball? Um, and and it does in many ways. But uh, but man, yeah, it's slow compared to today's world. That's for sure. So that's why I'm a hockey fan. Just constant action left and right, and excitement yes. all over the place so we'll, we'll have to talk volleyball sometimes it's a fun sport to play for sure uh very cool well thank you kevin we appreciate that uh i definitely am going to retire smarter after listening to our past couple of episodes that's a given uh more coming up on the next edition we'll start maybe a new series a new piece of content we'll, we'll leave you hanging we won't tell you what we're going to be talking about on the next show you'll just have to come back and find out but we will certainly retire smarter once again next time around. For Kevin, I'm Walter. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Information provided is for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Information is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accurateness and completeness cannot be guaranteed. All performance reference is historical and not an indication of future results. Benchmark indices are hypothetical and do not include any investment fees.